This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hey, welcome back. This is Enoch, and a few words before we get started. Today's guest is not currently involved in the architecture design industry, although that's where he got his start. But I'm still hoping that through our conversation you can pull something about his success in business that you can apply to your success as an architect. Now, when I first started Business of Architecture, I wrote a blog post about a young intern architect who was laid off from his job in late 2008, about the same time that I was laid off from my job working down in Panama in late 2008. Now, Pat Flynn, as I mentioned, was an intern architect in the San Francisco Bay Area. He'd been out of school, went to Cal Berkeley, graduated in 2005, and progressed rapidly through the company. He was promoted to job captain. He was earning $60,000 a year, which, as we know, is a very healthy salary for someone that, that early out of school. Now, when he was laid off, it was just a crushing blow, as it was to all of us who experienced the lack of work over the past three or four years. And in that blog post, I talk about how Pat used that that fear and that anxiety at that time pivoted and turned it into success. So Pat is now a best-selling author. He just released a book, Let Go, which is a story about his road, his path from unemployed intern architect to internet marketing superstar, online businessman. So Pat currently earns on a monthly basis anywhere from forty to $60,000 a month from his online activities. So, Pat, before we go on, I know there are people in the audience who are just thinking they heard that wrong, that it's forty to $50,000 a year, but no, it's forty to fifty to $60,000 every month. So would you just describe to us, the lay people, you know, how, how do you make $60,000 a month on the internet? What are you doing to bring in that kind of money? Um. First of all, thank you for having me. And and, and it, I know it sounds crazy. And if I were to, th- you know, if someone were to tol- tell me, um, you know, Pat, in the future, if back in two thousand eight, if someone were to tell me, Pat, you you're going to make this much money in the future, I would have just been like, no, no, no way. Um, so the way I do it, I mean, it's not it's not like a system. Um, it's 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 basically creating businesses that solve a particular problem or sort of uh, you know provide a solution to someone's pain whatever that pain may be and I'm not talking about physical pains I'm talking about you know creating study guides for exams or helping people discover how to use the internet or how to become a security guard or um, you know I, I have a number of different businesses online and they all work sort of in the same way by providing high value content that I can teach somebody something, something that they're learning to try and do, sort of becoming the expert in their eyes. Uh, and when I mean expert, I don't necessarily mean, you know, being certified or, uh, you know, uh, actually having like a, you know, just actually knowing a little bit more than someone else qualifies you to be an expert in someone's eyes to a point where someone might actually pay you for that information because you have that experience that people are trying to understand and that information that they're trying to learn. And so, you know, my, my primary example, my very first online business is actually in, our, in the architecture world. Um, a lot of you know the lead industry. Well, my very first business was built around the lead industri- industry, actually helping people pass an exam, um, you know, the lead exam. And so I built a study resource. At first, it was a, a website that was sort of just giving away content for free, um, telling people step by step how uh, this exam works and sort of the content behind it and what to memorize. Um, and that turned into a study guide ebook that I sold on that website. And the very first month I sold that book um, just changed the rest of my life. And that was after a few months uh, being laid off from the architecture world. So I took some knowledge that I had in the architecture world, a very specific niche, one that was sort of underserved at the time, and just sort of becoming the top resource for that, providing information for that, sort of developing relationships with the people who were, who were sort of coming to my website. You know, I wasn't just, hey, there's this website that sells a study guide. I was, hey, there's this guy named Pat Flynn. He took the exam. He passed it. He knows all about the exam, and he's helping people pass it too, um, which just has been incredible for any businesses that I have, and, and has sort of just sort of paved the, the path for um, any businesses that I create, and, and that's really sort of putting person personality in, in, into your uh, into the work that I do, and sort of not just becoming um, the product or not just becoming uh, you know a, a service, but actually becoming a brand and a, a personality that uh, people can 
can connect to. So, you know, technically how I make money is on that website that I just mentioned, I sell an ebook and I sell practice exams and uh, study guides and things like that. On smartpassiveincome.com, which is a site that I built to sort of teach people how to do business online and take advantage of systems of, of automation on the internet, um, tools and services that can help you sort of automate your business a little bit and also social media. Um, I make money uh, a number of different uh, directions, um, you know, uh, product sales through affiliate marketing, which means you know, finding products that other people have created, other products that um, other companies have created, and selling those and getting a commission as a result of selling those. Um, and mostly what I do is I just recommend those products by showing people how I use them and how they've helped me. And, um, you know, that's that's the best part of it is, is I'm not forcing any, anyone to do anything. I'm just showing people how I do certain things, and these are the tools and services I use along the way. If you choose to use them, um, here's my link. If you go through this link, I'll, I'll earn a commission. You know, I'm always very honest and upfront about that. Um, I don't actually sell any sort of how to make money online products. I just give away information for free. And again, along the way, I might share these tools and services. So that's how I make money on that website. I have a number of other websites that make money through advertisements. Um, I do some coaching. I was uh, the director of web and social media for a movie that came out last, uh, last year. Um, and so I made money through fees for that service that I provided. Um, so just a number of different ways. I also have an iPhone application company with 27 apps in iTunes right now, and that's generating a few thousand dollars a month, mostly on autopilot. So I'm just sort of all over the place. And you might be like, whoa, this guy is crazy. Like he just does everything. Um, he's sort of all over the place. Um, but I sort of, ever since Smart Passive Income sort of took off like it has, I mean, I have over 70,000 uh, monthly subscribers and, um, you know, People just sort of expect me to try new things and become sort of this crash test dummy when it comes to doing business online. And, um, you know, I don't mind sharing my failures and everything I've done wrong. I think that's why people sort of enjoy the content that I create on that site because I create businesses publicly. I show people what I do right. I show people what I do wrong. And I sort of recommend uh, what to do and hopefully and also often what not to do. So that, that's how it works. Okay. So just to rephrase, so you started with a lead study guide. That was your first product, and that was what launched you into the online world. And then since then, you developed a lot of other products. Now, you said you do some, you're doing some iPhone apps. Mm -hmm. You're doing some online advertising. You do some, affiliate, do some marketing. affiliate marketing, which is where you're selling products that other people have and getting a commission off of it. So, Pat, when I hear that, I'm thinking, okay, these are very different. If, if I don't know anything about Internet marketing, I'm thinking they're very different kind of businesses. So right. what's the what's the one thread that sort of connects them all that allows you to really be able to do them all with the knowledge you have? Absolutely. A fantastic question. Um, there are two common things. One is first finding that particular market and really diving into their specific pains and their wants and needs and desires and really trying to truly understand them by actually building real relationships with them. I mean, I, I remember the names of a lot of people who purchased my ebook or who were struggling with the lead exam that we would go back and forth with, with emails trying to help each other out um, and, and actually understanding what it is that they needed and, and then providing that solution. That's the second part of it. Um, and and uh, you know, doing so in a way where you're not making people feel like that 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 you know that, that they're being scammed into it or you know not not playing off of hype or you know that that was the one thing when i when i got into online business um i initially had this very disgusting thought of how on the business was um before i got into it how it was a very scammy sort of very car salesman -y sort of um you know industry well and i, then I agree I, yeah i mean you see those little advertisements in your email that show you know brighten your teeth or this this woman in your town such and such you know <laughs> yeah i mean and, and that still exists and um you know sadly those things still work but on, on most people any um you know we we are getting smarter now to realize that 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 those things aren't necessarily true all the time especially when it comes to sort of get rich quick you know type of things that are being sold out there uh, which is a sort of a very bad thing that's sort of going around in the space that I'm in, which is sort of teaching people how to build real businesses that provide value that actually improve the world, um, as opposed to these people who are sort of playing off the idea of, you know, you can push a button and make money tomorrow. Um, but, but the common thread is building these relationships, understanding what the true problems and pains are, and the, 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 what people would want, um, and then providing them a solution that would actually help them. 
And sometimes that solution is a product that I can create on my own, such as that lead exam website and that lead exam uh, study guide and practice tests. Sometimes it's a product that I can't create on my own, but it's something that other people or other companies have created. And it's only right that I share that and, and, and promote that because it helps them. Again, it's all about helping and serving that audience. And, and I think that's really where um, businesses sort of miss it these days is, is, is they start with either an idea uh, and and they, they spend a ton of time and money trying to, to get this idea out there. And they never even asked anybody if it's actually something that would be useful. I mean, there's a story about a guy I know who um, spent two years developing this really high-end yoga mat. Um, actually, this is a story from, from, from a couple of guys that I know who uh, – and it's just a story that stuck with me. This guy spent a couple of years – building and, and creating and getting doing research and getting all this interesting material to get you know this really high-end yoga mat done and he has spent two years in, in, in you know 50 grand 50 to 100 grand you know a lot of his life savings to, to figure this out and when he tried to market it nobody bought it because nobody wanted it and all he had to do was go to a couple of yoga studios maybe come up with a prototype and and just bring it and just be like hey is this something that you would be useful how much would you pay for it and really do the market research um, then he would know that he wouldn't have to waste any more time and money doing that. Um, uh, Eric Reese wrote a book recently called The Lean Startup, which is really good and talks about sort of releasing the minimum viable product to just test something that, that you are potentially thinking of creating. Whoa, 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 buzzword, buzzword, man. Help us out here. Minimum viable product. I mean, maybe some people know what that is, but explain that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was getting into it. It's, 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 it's launching a product that provides a solution, but without all the bells and whistles, without... You know, it just it just helps and serves that audience, but it it, it it's the minimum amount that would do that. The another way to put it is the minimum effective dosage. That's another sort of term that people use, and another way to think about it. You know, just the minimum thing that would help people. Um, and when you do that and you release that, and you know, a lot of people are scared to do that. They're like, oh, well, this isn't a finished product. Um, it is and it isn't. It is in the way that it actually does what it's supposed to do. But it's not because you want to get feedback from your customers. And to have them help you shape and help you pivot where to go next. Oftentimes that will happen, or oftentimes what will happen is you'll create that minimum viable product, which takes a lot less time, a lot less money, a lot less resources. You go out there and, you know, you get people to come and experience it. And they're going to tell you right away that either it's not something that's useful or that they're going to help you understand sort of where to go next or if it's even worth going on with it um and that's a way to sort of that and that's a that's a the, the whole lean startup model that's a sort of terms that are being thrown around in in the startup world these days you see a lot of these products apps and web apps that come out that are lean products that they launch sort of with the minimum sort of uh features they get a number of people in there and they get user feedback and they use that user feedback to tell them what to do next so that there's no guessing involved. It's, you know, their customers, their target customers are telling them exactly what to do. Um, and, and um, you know, I, I truly believe in that sort of uh, business model. And so I've been taking that on myself these days and, and sort of, um, you know, taking the journey of these businesses that I create and asking my audience and the target audience of those products, you know, well, does this work? What should I do next? I even ask my audience in an email, well, what are you struggling with? Or what do you feel like I could do better? Or, um, you know, actually tapping into my audience and, and, and being vulnerable. I think that, that that's a good way to put it. Um, and something that helps me stand out from a lot of the other people in this niche that I'm in, you know, just, just putting myself out there, not being afraid to show sort of weaknesses here and there. And I think that just shows that I'm actually a real person and someone that people can connect with, as opposed to someone who just shares only the good things and someone that may not be um, sort of attainable or, or reachable. Yeah, I think, I think you probably deserve the nickname the most likable guy on the internet. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, you, it's, it's interesting because you're not the first person to say that. And, um, you know, what scares me about that, it, you know, I really am happy that people think of me that way and, and I, I truly embrace that. Um, but what's scary is that, you know, I am just being someone who's authentic and honest and, and the fact that being authentic and honest is the reason I stand out is really scary. Like I, I it, it means that there are a lot of bad guys out there, um, you know, which which helps me, of course. But I, I, I wish everybody was doing business in an honest manner, which is sort of why I do what I do and why I'm so open about it to, to show people that, you know, you can do a business in an honest way and, and, and have it be successful. Um, you know, where everybody is a winner, not just you, the product creator and the person making money, but the person who's on the receiving end of that product too. Um, I don't, you know, I think 
you know, the vulnerability plays a, plays a role in that. The fact that, you know, I'm not afraid to share failures. And, and also, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't feel like I'm better than anybody else. I'm just someone who, who loves to take action and, and just see what, see what happens, you know, and, and sort of share the results along the way. So, Pat, before this call, we talked about how you have your roots in architecture. You went to architecture yeah. school. Uh, we did the same thing in studio. And so this is really a homecoming for you. I mean, this is, uh, you said it's your first opportunity to speak to the architectural community sort of en masse. It is. And I, I'm, I'm really, I, I was telling you right before this, I, I'm, the, I'm actually doing a lot of interviews today because I'm promoting my book. But this is one interview that I was actually really excited about because I haven't gotten to speak about architecture in a while. And, in, you know, I left the world of architecture um, not in disgust uh, for, from from what I, I actually loved my job like I loved my job and that's why I actually was so hurt by getting let go I had done everything I was supposed to be doing ever since middle school you know getting great grades and doing all the extracurriculars and, and, and doing everything that I was supposed to do I was on the path I was the youngest person in our firm to become a job captain I was taking the lead exam and, and going to AIA meetings and doing all these other things um, and I still got let go and that's why I was so upset but I, I loved what I was doing and I still miss the world of architecture. I mean, I went to school for five years for it, um, and you know, I don't get to draw anymore, or I don't get to do AutoCAD. I, I miss AutoCAD. I mean, I, man, I anytime do. you want to just do a couple drawings, <laughs> Pat, you got the hookup, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't yeah, even I'm know what Twitter is right now. Or I don't know if anybody, if everybody's on Reddit. I mean, or not Reddit, but on on Revit. Um, I, I'm that disconnected from the world right now, and I still keep in contact with a couple of my co, my ex coworkers, but but not to talk about architecture. We talk about, you know, the good old days and, 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 you know, gossip and whatever. But, uh, yeah, I, I miss it. And, and, um, yeah, so, you know, if you have some drawings, uh, send them my way. And you bet. I'll, I'll, I'll I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure you have tons of extra time with, uh, <laughs> seven businesses, a blog. I mean, it's funny you say that because I actually do have a good amount of time every day and I spend that with my kids and you might wonder, well, how does someone take care of seven businesses and have extra time during the day to like be with their family or do other things like, AutoCAD, which I don't do, but I potentially could. Um, it's the fact that you know these businesses are run semi-automated, where I don't have to be there in order for a transaction to happen. You know, these iPhone apps, I don't have to be there in order to process those those payments. You know, Apple's doing that for me. Well, on, on my Green Exam Academy website, people can come and purchase those eBooks or those study guides or practice exams, and it gets sent to them automatically without me having to be there. Now, it's not like I can walk away from the business 100% forever. I still have to upkeep and I will have to answer a customer email every once in a while, but I don't have to be there in order for transaction to happen. And that's the beauty of it. And that, that, that frees up my time completely um, to do other things or, or, or be with my family and or work on new businesses. And I mean, that's how I've been able to create sort of seven different things at the same time um, because I'm not actually creating them at the same time. I'm sort of creating them one by one. Pat, in, in reading your book, Let Go, which I recommend everyone check it out, amazing, inspiring book. Thank you. I noticed that there's, there's sort of a common thread. It's, you're a very ambitious person that comes across, that even in, at a young age, you were always striving and pushing yourself. And I just want to ask you, you know, you've probably done some soul searching. Do you know what it is that drives you to be so ambitious and always, you know, pushing it continually, not well, settling? I think, yeah, I think it stems from, from sort of growing up with my dad. Um, and my mom too, but but my dad, I remember, you know, he he was always teaching me and, and, and pushing me to, to 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 do as much as I can in life, um, uh, and it even got to a point where it was a, I just was tired of it for a while because I remember a couple times back in school, this is like in middle school, um, in middle school, like I would get I would come home with a test that 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 I got a ninety eight percent on, you know, an a, a an A, and I would come back home and I'd be like, Dad, I got a ninety eight percent on this test, and he'd be like, What happened to the other two percent? Um, and I'd be like, oh, like it would it would push me really hard to you know I, I don't know if I'm ambitious now because I want to impress him, but I I feel like because he taught me to always work really hard, I've always gotten really good results from that, you know, um, not not in a way to where I'm trying to just please him, but because I've learned from him that if I do work hard, great things will happen. And and I don't think he really expected me to get 100 percent every time and work for perfection. I mean, perfection I've learned is probably the um, one, of, one, of the, one of the forms of, uh, of, of procrastination, uh, you know, just trying to be perfect at something. Uh, you can't get perfect at anything, really. And so sometimes you just have to ship what's out there. Um, so, you know, it's interesting when, when I say that. But, you know, I, my mom also taught me, you know, it's, it's, you know, 
there is joy in working hard and, and, you know, amazing things can happen as a result of working hard now for something later. I mean, she worked two jobs for a really long time um, and she enjoyed every part of it. Um, and, and they weren't even jobs that normal people would consider, uh, you know, very, you know, fulfilling. I mean, my mom uh, was, a, was a cafeteria lady by day and then a security guard at night. She sounds like a superhero, right? Um, uh, by day and by night, but um, you know she loved every process of it, and I think that taught me to 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 love every process of what I do and make sure that what I do is something that that's uh, that I enjoy. And and sometimes when it it might be something that you know normal people might not enjoy, I actually do enjoy. I I love the process of trying to figure things out, um, and I think a lot of that actually stemmed from my education in architecture. You know, um, just 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 trying to figure things out. Um, you know, because it wasn't easy, and there's never um, I, I, what I love about what architecture taught me is that, that there's, there's not actually one perfect solution for all the problems out there. You know, we're, we're presented with a, de- a design problem or a scenario, and there's not always a perfect solution every time. There, there's multiple solutions, and there's different ways to sort of express that solution based on who you are and what your personality is. And I sort of put that into my business as, as, as well. I mean, that's one of the many things I've sort of taken away from my time being educated as an architect and also working as an architect for a little bit. Yeah, um, how how much would you think that design education actually helped you? Has that been a good thing for you, or the the actual design part of it? Yeah, it, it, it has actually helped me sort of develop an eye for for usability, I guess. And you know, on on the web on the web, it's it's all about user interface. When well, I mean I mean the problem solving aspect. So when I say design, I mean like design studio. You know, like you mentioned. Right. Right. Sorry, <laughs> I thought you meant actual design or like you know one of the. One of the only things I've I, I in architecture versus what I do now, there's only one thing that I, that is really common as far as the actual tools that I use, and that that's Photoshop. So I still use Photoshop uh, to, to today. But when it comes to sort of finding those design solutions um, and, and sort of figuring out the solutions now, you know what it, what it has taught me is that finding those solutions is is a, is a process. And and in school, you know, it's 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 about um, sort of taking that larger goal. I mean, this is how we did it in the studio. We we had a big sort of goal to work toward at the end of at the end of the semester, but within that big goal, we chunked it up into maybe two or three three week increments where we we would meet with the jury every two or three weeks to to sort of tackle one specific part of that problem, so that at the end we had this overall solution. Um, and and that's sort of how you have to take things today in, in in business. You know, take that big goal that you have and then really chunk it up and really just focus on that one little next milestone that you have to do and that gets rid of all the overwhelm that gets rid of all the things that you might potentially have to think about to do later and it just gets you to focus on what you do now and really try to understand how to do that and whatever you need to learn that's it's all just focused on that whatever it is that you're doing right now so um that i I think that's another sort of way that architecture sort of taught me that that it's a process you know there are different phases of design and and there's just like there are different phases in in developing solutions for problems uh, through your internet business um, you know, so I hope that makes sense. Of course, you know, you're talking to the, the architect audience. I'm not used to this. <laughs> <laughs> Pat, the, the other question I wanted to, to ask you was taking what you know now about business, um, you have a, a much different perspective on architecture. Mm-hmm. What's your perspective on, you know, we talk a lot amongst ourselves about how we can run better businesses. Have you thought about that? Have you thought about with what you have now, how could, what's your suggestion for how small firms and solo architects could run better businesses from what you've learned in business? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things, I think. If I could go back into architecture um, in, with some any kind of uh, sort of say in how a business might be run in, in architecture, I, I would have a lot to say because I've, I've, I've been in the, in the Internet business for a while. Um, you know, first of all, just get rid of your Flash websites. Um, and then that's just like a rent, that's just like a pet peeve of mine when I go to architecture websites, especially when I go on like an iPad. Like I can't see your website because it's on Flash. That's just one thing. But anyway, that that that's not even that significant uh, compared to these other things. I mean, really, what has helped me in my business is is creating systems. Um, and that was one thing I think that it was missing, at least in the firm I was in. Um, everything was, you know, th- there were there were systems, but it, it wasn't always clear, and different people were doing different jobs. And I, and I think. Um, you know, there's something to be said to spending a lot of time trying to figure out the efficient way to do things, um, even just the little tasks. Because a lot of the, even 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 getting, you know, the printers to work quickly, or or understanding who goes to the back to get them to who's the one who's supposed to do this or that. I mean, 
if you can understand a lot of those little small things, it's just going to make things happen a lot faster. And it's going to stop any of the bottlenecks. And it's just going to make sure that, you know, over time, you know, you think about a minute here and a minute there. And you think about how long it takes to sort of take a project from, from idea to, to groundbreaking that project and, and, and actually, you know, cutting the ribbons to it. Um, it takes a really long time. So if you have these systems that can save you even just a minute or two, um, whenever you do these specific tasks, it adds up. And, and when, when we're talking about billable hours, um, you know, I know that's a whole other topic, but um, you know, there, there's money to be saved there. Or there's, there's, there's opportunity to spend that time doing other things that, that are potentially more useful. Um, you know, one, another big thing was, was um, just, you know, I felt like when I was in architecture, uh, just being a, a drafter, um, I really knew what was going on in the buildings because I was drawing the designs and because I was in there and I could see the relationships. And I think, I don't know if that's just me because I came from Cal, which is, you know, everything I learned at Cal was hand drawing. Um, and that was actually a big struggle coming from Cal was we didn't do any art. We, it, AutoCAD wasn't even required to graduate, which, you know, I have some feelings about that. But it was really difficult to get a job be, as a result of that. But there were some good things that came out of just hand drawing the whole time is I really get, got to understand spaces and, and relationships between spaces really well. And I felt like as a drafter putting those designs on, on, onto AutoCAD, you know, I, I had a lot of things that I wanted to say that I didn't feel comfortable saying. Um, because I just wasn't in a position to to say things, you know. I was just my job was to put stuff in AutoCAD, and I feel like there's something to be said to, you know, at least having some time for everybody to sort of speak up about a project. You know, it's it's a team effort, and when it's a, when it's just one person sort of, um, you know, who who's in charge, and the other people don't even have a say. You know, I, I I've learned a lot from working with a team in my online business, and when everyone sort of has an opportunity to at least say something or feel comfortable saying something. I mean, it just takes the business to a whole new level. Um, other things, uh, when it comes to client relationships, I, f I feel like um, that's probably the most important thing is just to make sure the clients are happy, but also to keep them involved in the process too. I think that's really interesting. Um, something that I do when I create something new, I actually have my audience follow me along the process and or at least give them the option to do that so i think it, you know there's something to be said for potentially having your clients um you know sort of follow along with the process and you know keeping them in check on where things are so that you know they're not bugging you all the time on where the process is i mean they know because you're providing them with sort of reports along the way um and you're sort of being very transparent about what's going on and that just sort of opens up lines of communication i mean i think there's nothing more important than the relationship you have with the, the people who are actually going to be paying you that money um, and, and, and then, you know, problems start to show up earlier, which is good, you know, when, when you sort of open up the process, you know, um, instead of just sort of doing it in chunks, you work really hard and then you present and then all of a sudden you have to change all these things. Well, what if you were sort of not working together in real time, but at least giving them the option to check up on you every once in a while, or you give them progress reports over time, um, in a way where they can sort of help you make sort of design decisions or make these calls in your design much sooner in the process and you get to move along much faster. Um, and then also, I mean, there's so many things. Um, just I remember how difficult it was to sort of understand um, what all, I mean, there's so many moving pieces when it comes to to a building and, and, and different people who are involved. I mean, just I feel like if there was a way, and I don't even know if that this exists now because there, there wasn't um, some sort of collaboration tools that everyone can use to sort of understand what everyone else is doing because there were so many times where either I was getting interrupted or I had to interrupt somebody to sort of figure out where they were, where, where, where they were or what they were doing. Um, and it just sort of just broke up the workflow uh, all the time. And, and so, you know, I use a tool now in my online business with my team called Basecamp. And we always keep each other, um, you know, up to date on what we're doing and where we're at. So um, we can focus when we need to focus or when something comes up, we can sort of ask each other and get help from each other and collaborate. I think that at least in the firm I was in, um, there wasn't as much collaboration as there could have been between all the team members. And, you know, when, when a team truly feels like a team, instead of just this person does this and this person does that and that's it, um, you know, when, when that team's there, the, 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 it's going to show uh, in, in sort of the overall project, I feel. Pat, what, what lessons have you learned about connecting with people online and utilizing the Internet that you think architects could use? 
Well, when it comes to the internet, I mean, the, the internet is a beautiful place because, especially now, the ability for things to be shared. And there's no, if, we, if you want to talk about marketing, there's no better marketing tool you have than the people who you have already served. Because those are the people who are going to understand all about you and what you can provide. And when they share you with their friends, family, followers, clients, consultants, whatever, and they recommend you, that's much more powerful than you going to those people directly because you are just sort of going there cold. When somebody has that relationship already and you can go through them, that's much more important. That's why I really think even after potentially a, a project has been completed with a client, it's, it's, it's really important to follow up with them and give them opportunities to sort of uh, a, remember who you are and what you did what you did for them. Hopefully it was good work. But also B, just allow them and give them opportunities to sort of share you with other people or maybe potentially other builders or the opportunity to work with them again. Um, and, and again, just taking things to the next level and taking that relationship to a place where people can sort of either recommend you if something uh, uh, of the service that you provide comes up in conversation or just rehire you because you did such good work for them. Um, you know, really the best cost, I mean, in, in online business or any business, um, it's really easy to sell new products to people who are already your customers because they have already purchased from you. They've already experienced the product that you can provide and the kind of service that you can create for them. Um, and, and, and so if you do that really well, um, you want to make sure that you can hopefully tap back into that um, same customer or client that you had before. Earlier, you talked about getting inside the head of a person and using that to give them an offer that's that's an irresistible offer, I guess. Do you have any suggestions for how to do how will you how would you do that if you were an architect and you're sitting down with a client, you know, knowing what you know now and about business, how would you try to figure out what they want? Keep asking questions. I mean, that's really the thing. Is and a lot of people will, will ask questions, which is good to try and figure out the sort of needs and wants of a client or 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 a customer, uh, or a potential client or a potential customer. But many times, people will keep it either on on the the, the surface level questions or or even just one or two levels deep. But it's really in those sort of fifth, sixth, seventh level questions when you know what I mean by that is is continuing the conversation based on that very first question you ask and keep asking why or why do you feel that way or how come how come it's like that or you know think questions like that where you can truly understand the root of whatever it is that they're thinking and why they're thinking that way i mean that that helps you understand the language that you should use with them that helps you understand exactly where they're coming from and so um that, that that's really how you can tap in and you know i wish i could do a sort of um actually if you listen to podcast uh, spi podcast episode number 46 it's an interview with a guy named dane maxwell he talks about all the perfect sort of best questions you can ask someone that you're potentially going to serve through uh, a service or a product um, just to really get down into the nitty-gritty details of, of, of how you should be providing that solution to them. Or so oftentimes you'll get to a point where you're asking these questions and, and I'm not exactly sure how, how might this apply to architecture, but in online business when you're trying to develop a solution for a particular target market, oftentimes you'll ask enough questions and get deep enough where eventually that person who you're asking that, those questions to will tell you exactly what it is that they need. Like, exactly. And, and, and there's, the, there's the product right there, and you don't have to guess anymore. So again, just, just really going deep into, the, uh, to, into someone's head um, by asking questions and sort of dissecting. It sort of goes along, I, I can't remember the Japanese term, but the Toyota manufacturing process, they use this thing that, that is, uh, I can't remember the Japanese name, but it, 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 it involves asking why, like five times. So if there is sort of an issue in the manufacturing process, everything stops, like the whole factory stops, and then they ask the first level question, well, why did the factory, or why did this break? Well, why did this, why did that happen, and why did this happen? And then you, for, you know, typically five levels deep, you can get to the root of the problem where, oh, somebody forgot to install replacement batteries in this, where on the surface, you wouldn't even get to that point and understand really what the true problem is where if you can get to the root, then everything above that sort of solves itself on its own. So I think, you know, sort of using that example um, is, 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 a, is, a, is sort of a great sort of way to approach sort of dissection and, and sort of understanding the problems and, and things that are going on. Excellent. So let go, the book, obviously a double meaning. Tell us what is the meaning of that book? What's, what's that book about? 
Sure. I mean, it's actually a triple meaning um, when you think about it. Uh, on the surface level, um, it's about my journey after getting let go from architecture. Uh, on the second level, it, it's, it's about really letting go of what I was conditioned to learn. The fact that, you know, my dad had always taught me and he led by example that, you know, I had to have a nine to five job, work at it for 40 years until I was 65 and then retire. I mean, that's what I was taught when I was growing up and that's what I was supposed to do and that's on the path that's the path I was on it was really it was really hard to leave that I mean it was hard to walk away from that and try something on my own when I had already devoted five years of my life and all the rest of my education to getting to this point I mean I felt like almost I was throwing all that away and I was worried that I was going to be disappointing people um, my parents who had spent money on my education as an architect by getting away from that um, but on another level it was also sort of letting go of those fears and, and all, all the resistance and the doubt that was sort of filling my head when I was sort of carving this new path in my life. I mean, I, every step along the way, you'll see in the book that I was met with some sort of doubt um, or, or I just didn't believe in myself or, or I just was met with these barriers. Either they were technological barriers or just worrying about what people thought about me or sometimes it was even people like my dad who said I should actually go back to school. You know, a lot of times the resistance in our life is not something that we create on our own. It's a lot of other people and, and you know, family, friends who may not believe in the path that we're in. And uh, for me, it was my dad who was like, you know what, you should go back to school. You should go back and get a graduate degree in architecture. You can come out of school. You can get a better job. You'll, be, you'll have better pay. Um, and the thing about my dad was, you know, he was always bright. And that's what I hated about it because, you know, I knew I could have done that. But I had just been so hurt by working so hard, doing everything I was supposed to do and still having the rug sort of slip out under me or, or pulled away from me. And, um, you know, that I knew I had to, to, to continue on my own and, and I have never looked back since. Although, I, like I said, I, I do miss the world of architecture and that's why I was super stoked to come on today. Um, but, you know, I, I, I probably would have still been happy if I, if I, if I had kept my job. Um, I would still be happy as an architect today, but I wouldn't know what it would be like to be this happy. Well, Pat, I think that's an awesome place to leave the interview. And, you know, from, I'll speak for all the other architects, we're glad that you're, you're out there spreading the word that you were an architect and kind of, you know, letting people know, popping up on the radar. But uh, we're glad that you're having success in the online marketing world. Uh, well, thank you so much. And I'm happy to be an architect in, uh, you know, uh, I'm, happy to be re I'm happy to be representing the world of architecture in the world of online marketing um, and, 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 you know, being known as a sort of likable person online, I guess, like you said. Um, so I appreciate all the kind words. I appreciate the attention of those of you listening or, and watching this right now. Um, so uh, all the best of luck to, to all of you. Great, great. So you can go and find more about Pat and listen to his uh, Smart Passive Income. Uh, podcast, which is at smartpassiveincome.com. And what else am I leaving out, Pat? Other ways to connect with you? Uh, patflynn.me slash let go is how you can get the book let go if you wanted to check it out. Um, and, and really, if you would just want to say hi to me on Twitter, you can say hi at Pat Flynn. Excellent. All right, Pat. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. See you later. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, that's it for today. If you like this video, please share it by clicking one of the share buttons. And to get updates when I post a new article, video, or podcast, visit businessofarchitecture.com, sign up for our email list, and I'll send you my exclusive ebook, Social Media for Architects. Everybody knows that you just gotta do it.